to Spirit of the Outdoors, another episode of Just In Time. I got some scriptures I want to read you out of St. John chapter 5. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these days lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Then Jesus saw him and saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I am on my way, or while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now this is a story. It's more about Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath day. And that gives them cause and reason to accuse Jesus. But that ain't what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about this multitude of people that are hanging around the pool waiting for an angel to trouble the waters. You see, in Bethesda, there's a pool. And everybody knew that if there's something wrong with you, once a year there's an angel will come and stir up these waters. When that happens, whoever's the first one in will be healed. And there was a multitude that gathered around that pool and just sat there. That was all they had to do. This man had been sitting there waiting for a miracle for 38 years. The first question that comes to my mind is, for 38 years, what all did he miss out on that he could have done hoping he'd find his way into that water first and be made whole. The next thing is, is, you know, at least they had something to hope in. At least they knew that, you know, once a year, somebody can be healed. Y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm tired of Bethesda revival. Did you know maybe once a year, somebody will be saved? <laughs> Maybe once a year in our church, we'll have a miracle. Sadly, some of y'all are just like the man at Bethesda. Your church ain't seen a miracle in 38 years. Ain't seen nobody delivered. Ain't seen no blind heal. Some of us ain't even got a Bethesda pool. Ain't no hope. At least at this time, we knew that, hey, once a year, somebody will be made whole, have a miracle. And you walk to this pool and imagine for a moment that you go down there and you just walk around and look. And you got all these broken, crippled people hanging around hoping, waiting. looks just like a church see we get in our minds that when we go to a church that it's supposed to be perfect we get in our mind that we're gonna go to this church and everything's gonna be all the people are just right all the people are uh, they've got it all together all these people are are just wonderful, wonderful people. 
and they are without sin. They don't do nothing wrong. That's the kind of church I want to be a part. I don't want to be in no church where people's got sin and got this. And... Y'all, this pool where there was miracles happening, just one a year, it was littered with afflicted people. The people that come to that pool were broken people. People that didn't have no hope in nothing else but that troubled water. You've been looking for a church. You've been trying a place that you fit in. Stop looking for a perfect church. There's some characteristics of a church you need to look for. I mean, you, you need the one that, that at least they're going to have troubled water along. One, at least there's a miracle once a year. You know, I mean, that's what the Bible, they had that at Bethesda. It breaks my heart sometimes to know how long some of us have been without a miracle, without anything to hope for, without anything to believe in. I'm tired of Bethesda revival. I'm tired of coming to church for a year hoping that, you know, maybe maybe within a year, once a year, some somebody will get a miracle. We we can have we can have a good service, you know. Somebody will be delivered something. And we're we're content with that. We'll sit right there on that porch and watch that water. Year after year after year. Well, I didn't get my miracle this time. Maybe next time. There's good and there's bad in this. I can find pros and I can find cons. At least this man was faithful. At least this man stayed there. He knew what, where his hope lied. He knew that was the only chance he had. I can fault him because, you know, you laid around this pool for 38 years, didn't do nothing else. And I don't know if they knew what time of year that this water was going to be troubled. The Bible is not distinctly clear about it. Uh, it may have been that they all showed up, you know, knowing that it's going to happen about this time of year, and they were there for a short while. But it leads you to believe that they were just there year round, waiting, you know, didn't know when the water might be troubled again. But either way, they wouldn't do it much else. Just sitting there waiting. Who's the first one to get in? And sounds like a bunch of selfish people, you know, if you really think about it. All about me. I'll run over another crippled man to make sure I get my miracle. But then again, you got to say, well, you know, you got to want it bad enough. With everything that can be said about Bethesda revival, the good, the bad, whatever, I'll tell you this, it ain't enough. There ain't no perfect churches. There's no perfect people. Churches are made up of broken people that have found something to hope in and believe in, and they hope God will give them a miracle. But what we have missed is the miracle worker. We like our religion. We like our church. We like our formality. We like the way things are. Don't bring something new in that I can't control. Don't bring something new in that I don't understand. And I know the old saying, you know, well, there's nothing new under the sun. And, you know, it, it ain't new. It's old. It's just new to you. Because the people's been so hard-headed and set in their ways for so many years that they didn't realize that there was a better way. 
This man sat at this pool for 38 years till Jesus walked up and said, do you want to be healed? And he said, I ain't got nobody to help. First thing he done is made an excuse. It ain't somebody else's fault. Ain't nobody here to put me in the water. And I'm crippled and, I, you know, I'm kind of slow. And time I get started over there, somebody beats me every time. But I'll wait till next year. Maybe I'll be the last one left and I'll get my miracle. Y'all, what I want to give you as a solution is this time to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Your formality of religion might work, might not, might help, might not. These people been in some churches for 38 years, still afflicted, still broken, still halt, still struggling with the same problems, still struggling with the same sin, the same addictions, the same pain, the same sickness. I want to tell you real quick, it's not God's will for you to remain the same all your life. You was given an encounter with Jesus Christ. He talked about it all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's all one story, you know. Jesus teaching, telling everybody what was going to happen. Told, and, and it's written in four different ways, so you'd get a good understanding if you read all four books. Figure out Jesus is talking about filling us with his spirit. He said, there's going to come a day I'm going to be inside of you. He told one of them, he said, if you'll drink from the water that I have, you'll never thirst again because it's living water. Those rivers of living water will flow out of you. Rivers of living water. What is living water? Well, that angel come down and troubled that water and made it alive for a moment. And whoever got in that water first was made whole. Jesus said, if you'll drink from the cup that I have. He said, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. That healing virtue will flow out of you. You say, well, I had never seen that. It's because you've been stuck at Bethesda for 38 years. It's because you've been holding on to some man-made form of religion for far too long. Oh, but this is what Grandma and Grandpa had. This is what Mama and Daddy shared, you know. And y'all, I, I got a lot of respect for what our elders had. The problem, though, with a lot of that is, is every generation that passed it off to the next generation didn't give all of it. It got weaker every time it was handed to a next generation. Nobody ever dug in this Bible for their self and tried to understand what it was talking about, what was real, and go back and reclaim some things that got lost somewhere along the way. Y'all, we got to get past the Bethesda revival. And we got to have a Jesus Christ revival. What am I talking about? You're going to have to make sure that you have an experience experience with Jesus Christ, an encounter, a life-changing experience, not a just, you know, form of religion. The Bible talks about Timothy having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In other words, we got a form of religion, but we're going to deny the power of that religion because we don't understand it. What were they denying? They denying the power of the Holy Ghost. The infilling of the Holy Ghost that comes all through the book of Acts of the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And that, Jesus said, once I fill you with this spirit, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Tongues is not the only evidence, okay? We know that there's one instance 
where a eunuch got it, that the Bible did not say that he spoke in tongues. But his life was changed. He was baptized. If your encounter with Jesus Christ has not changed you, you need to have a deeper relationship and a deeper experience. You need to try again to have that experience. Because regardless of whether you spoke in tongues or you didn't speak in tongues, if you really have an experience with Jesus Christ, it will change you. This man has been sitting here for 38 years. And Jesus walked up to him and said, Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be made whole? Ain't got nobody to help me. Ain't nobody told me what I don't. Nobody put me in the water. Ain't nobody shared with me there. Had nobody poured this on me. Had nobody taught me this. Had nobody give me this. See what I'm talking about? But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ that he left a different man. He left made hope. It's not God's will for you to encounter him and leave with the same pain that you met him with. You see, I met Jesus Christ one night. I knew about him all my life. I talked to God. I believed on God. I prayed to God. I had even spoken in tongues before. I had already been baptized before in my life. But I never had a life-changing experience. Under one night, I was at the bottom of the barrel. That's what I like to call it. I was like the prodigal son, you know, kind of eating with the pigs. I was an alcoholic and watched my life come apart at the seams. And I hated me. I hated my family. I hated everybody around me. I hated my job. I hated the way I was living. I hated everything. Bitter, angry, frustrated, depressed, no hope, nothing to believe in. Looked at my life with nothing but a downhill spiral from the word go. Religion had never helped me. The church had never helped me. I could see where people could get frustrated with the church and say, you know what? Sick of Bethesda. Giving up on this mess. Ain't no hope for me here. Somebody beats me to the pool every time. But I was there one night and I said, Lord, I need you. Life can't keep going this way. If this is the way life's got to be from now on, I'd rather not even live it. Sick of it. Tired of it. Don't want nothing to do with this life no more. God, change me. Change my life, God. I begin to pour my heart out to him. Let tears run down my cheeks. Told him everything I'd ever done wrong and how sorry I was I'd done it. And I was tired of doing it. And God just, I blacked out speaking in other tongues. God began to pour into me a spirit. And when I come to realization after that, I was different. I felt different. I had joy. I had peace. I had happiness about me. All of a sudden, I was looking at the world through a new pair of glasses. I could see things a little more clearly. What I'm telling you is when you really have an experience with Jesus Christ and you really encounter the man that this guy sitting at the pool of Bethesda encountered, you're going to leave changed. You're not going to leave feeling the same way you did. If you walk away from your encounter with God whether where you got saved and you didn't really feel a drastic change come over you and a new feeling and an excitement and a joy then you didn't have what I had. You didn't have what this old boy at Bethesda had. And you need to go back to the well and start drinking from the water again. 
I ain't come in here today to try to break down your religion and tell you your church wrong and you need to find another church and another denomination and another religion. No. All I'm telling you is you need to stop and get on your knees that you sold yourself short of the best part. The best part. The best part of this whole walk with God, this whole Bible thing, this whole church thing, this whole idea of Christianity and religion, the, the whole meat and potatoes of this deal is not the church, is not the pastor, is not the singing, is not the organization, it's not the brotherly love, it's not the form of religion, it is not the rituals. It's all about the encounter you have with Jesus Christ. Do I have a problem with people saying, well, I, I say I believe on the Lord. No, I don't. You got to believe on the Lord. There's, there's no wrong scripture. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. The problem is, is people only want to take a few scriptures and just use just them. You got to use all of it. Any scripture should lead you to this experience. I'm not trying to sit here and say you go into hell without it. I'm not trying to sit here and say all this stuff. I didn't say I didn't believe that or I did believe that. I'll keep some of that to myself, okay? What I am trying to help people realize, baptism is a great thing. Baptism is a good thing. You can't get to heaven according to scripture without baptism. But this encounter with Jesus Christ supersedes that. People say, oh, well, what about this guy? He didn't have this or this guy. You know, Adam and Eve didn't have this. There was a whole lot of people throughout the Bible. Enoch did not have this. That we know of as far as reading scripture, Moses didn't have this experience. David didn't have this experience. Why is it important now? Because when Jesus rose up out of that grave and he rolled that tomb back, he had went to hell and he'd done some things in hell that we don't really know exactly what happened. We know he said he had the keys to death, hell, and the grave. The veil was rent in the temple that day. The man hanging on the cross had just looked at Jesus and said, forgive me and the Lord looked at him and said you'll be with me in heaven that was way before the veil was rent in the temple that was before the earthquake and that was before the resurrection Jesus told him said you go to Jerusalem and you wait for me I'm coming back Jesus come and talk to him again and then he ascended into the clouds and told him he said you'll see me return in like manner and they all standing there waiting for him to just come floating back down but that ain't really how it happened when they was in that upper room it said it descended like a dove and said cloven time cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them and they all begin to speak with other tongues as the spirit give the utterance It poured out of an upper room into the streets and said there was 3,000 added to the church that day. 3,000 in one day. At Bethesda, they sat and waited for one miracle a year. But on the day of Pentecost, there was 3,000 one day added to the church. It began to pour out everywhere. It began to turn upside down religion and Christianity as people knew it. This is the experience that you need to have. This is the thing that will change your life. Why do I say this? Because I had this experience and it is what changed my life. 
It was not my encounter with the pastor or my encounter with the church or my encounter with water baptism. I think every one of those things are pretty important and even baptism is critical. I'm not taking away from any scripture. I am not knocking any belief system. I am not trying to undermine and take away from anything that you already believe. I only want to do like Jesus said and fulfill the scripture. I want to add to it. Not something that ain't already there. I'm not making something up and putting it in the Bible. Not adding to this way. I'm trying to take something that's already in here that you've overlooked and help you add it to your life. Because y'all, it is the single one most important thing. Without it, none of this makes sense. That encounter with Jesus Christ I had is what opened my eyes to the understanding of the word. That is what leads me in my heart. That is what speaks through me when I try to share what I'm talking about. It's not the speaking in tongues that changes you. It's just that that's typically what happens when somebody has this experience. Does that mean that you're going to hell if you don't speak in tongues? I don't know. Bible ain't just real 100% clear on that. But being that that's what happened to everybody in the book of Acts when they talked about them receiving this power, this spirit, this life-changing event, this encounter, the thing that Jesus preached about for three and a half years was going to happen that he was going to be in them, that he was going to pour his spirit out on them, that they was coming a day that he was going to live inside of them, that their bodies was going to be a temple of the spirit. This is the experience. And what I am telling you is if there haven't been a change in your life, not a, well, I, I'm going to church now, I'm going to quit smoking, or I'm going to church now, I'm going to quit doing drugs. Well, that's good. But are you fighting it? Are you still wanting to, to do drugs every day? Are you still wanting to do that sin? you just, you know, struggling with it every day? That ain't what happened to me. When I walked away from it, I went in there and opened a bottle of tequila up and poured it down the sink. I reached over there and got a half-gallon bottle of George Dickel and poured it down the sink. I looked over there and got the bottle of, te of uh, something else. I, it was a clear Bacardi 101 or something. Poured it down the sink. I ain't want it. I ain't wanted it since. You see what I'm saying? It ain't something I'm struggling with. Am I perfect? No. Are there things in life that I struggle with? Yes. You're not going to become perfect. But those things that had control over you will lose their control. Their grip is loosened and you are free. I hope, y'all, that this made sense to you. I hope you understand that we got to get past a Bethesda revival and get to the revival of Pentecost. The 3,000 a day revival. Because the only thing that somebody wants is what they see in you, that change that they see in you. They'll want that. If there's nothing changed about you, you just go to church on Sunday now, you still the, you know, addicted to the same stuff, struggling with the same stuff, still the same attitude and all that. No peace, no joy, no happiness. People don't want that. They want peace in their heart that comes from this. I love y'all. I'm praying for you. I pray that God opens your eyes and opens your heart to receive this word. It's a life-changing experience, a life-changing event. God bless all of you. Remember, if you'll do a little better today than you did yesterday, tomorrow will be a better day. 
God bless you. We'll see you next time.